Hello and welcome to another F Car Guy video. Today I'll be running through the spec and general condition of my recently acquired Ferrari FF. The colour is Tour de France blue with interior colour Cuoio Toscana. We'll go through that in a moment. Um, I'm sure if you're looking at this video, you probably know all the headline figures, but it would be rude not to give them to you anyway. So we've got a 6.3 litre V12. Let's have a look at that. And she puts out 651 horsepower, 504 pounds foot of torque, and that's at 8,500 RPM. 0 to 62 is 3.7 seconds, top speed is 208 mile an hour. The total length front to back is 4.9. It's 1.95 meters wide and the height is 1.37 meters. And she weighs in at 1.8 tons. Uh, the engine's mated to a 7-speed uh, Getrag dual-clutch unit and the car is all-wheel drive of sorts. It's, it, it's really, a, a, and, and from the driving I've done in it, it really feels like a real-wheel drive car. But when you get into yourself into trouble, the front, gear, the front wheels will kick in. So it does that by a front-mounted two-speed gearbox. Um, it's called a PTU, power takeoff unit. It only activates in the first four gears of the normal transmission and transmits up to 20% of the torque. So when this car came out in 2012, I remember all the press uh, were shipped up to Northern Italy, into the Alps, and they were doing lots of driving through the Alps and then on the snow. Apparently, this is the car that Ferrari customers asked Ferrari to build because they didn't want to take up their boring Mercedes or BMW up to do the to the ski resorts they wanted to take. If you want spec, there's plenty of other videos that, that talk about spec. This is about the spec of my particular car, uh, the options that were ticked on it from new, and some of the options that are popular with, with, with other cars and some of the ones I missed out on. So the options that I have on mine are adaptive headlights, so essentially they will. And I've never had a car with this before, but the headlights will turn left or right with the input of the, the front steering. I've experienced that and it, it's quite handy. I don't think it's essential, but there you go. Yellow brake calipers. Believe it or not, if you don't spec it, they will just be, uh, is it silver or black? I think it's black. Never seen anyone with uh, black calipers on it. I think everyone chooses a colour of some description. I actually like the yellow. I think the yellow ties in well, you can see on that picture, with the Scuderia shield on the top left there and the wheel badge. I think that's quite nice. Electrochromatic mirrors simply means that they're heated, of course. We've got front and rear rear parking sensors. Now I'm going off the actual spec sheet of my of my uh, sales bill so I'm amazed that that's not a factory uh, fit item when you you have a look at the size of the car especially when you're sitting at that front driver's seat there you've got a lot of car in front of you so I'm amazed that sensors just don't come standard but apparently they are an option uh, 20 inch forged wheels, they are an option. I love this wheel when I was looking for cars, they were a must. And if I didn't have them, I would have bought them separately. Got to have those 20 inch forged wheels. I'm a bit old school. I, I like light wheels. I don't like dark wheels. Um, dark wheels are great to hide brake dust, but you don't have that problem with carbon ceramics. So I love painted silver wheels. Again, if I didn't find a car with this, I would have bought them and I would have painted them. Popular options for those wheels are also to have them in a sort of gunmetal colour with a polished face. They do look nice, but these wheels suit my taste perfectly. Uh, and they are also fitted with tyre pressure 
monitors as well, that's an option. All right, let's head inside and see what the options are inside. So inside that color again is a Cuoio Toscana color in semi-aniline leather. Uh, the camera I can already see is showing this as a more sort of orange color. It's not, it's, it's tan. Um, just a really nice light brown tan color. One option you get with the semi-aniline leather is the, the most amazing uh, leather smell, which unfortunately doesn't come through on the camera. I can only liken it to if you've ever, if you're a good husband and you buy your wife nice Italian leather bags and things like that, that's exactly what it smells like, that and uh, a good Italian leather furniture. I did a quick search on Coyo Toscana and what came up on those searches was an uh, Italian company which just makes leather shoes and leather bags. So I don't know if there's some sort of a link between those companies. I don't know whether Ferrari uses that company to provide this, this leather. I'm not sure. Maybe someone who knows a bit more about that might be able to shed some light because I don't quite understand it, but that's, that's what it's got. Um, there is a tracker. Um, I've probably not put that in order because now I'm going to go back to the seats. Uh, we've got Alcantara inserts inside. That is Alcantara in there and that runs along the bottom as well and even on the dashboard. Right through to the other side. We've got leather on the top as well in contrast stitching. The contrast stitching everywhere so the, the the dash and on the seats that's an option on here as well they are uh, called full electric seats i've not seen any with part electric seats but that must be an option so full electric seats so you can move the front of the base this section up and down the front of the rear of the base uh, sorry the rear of the base up and down as well uh obviously backwards and forwards tilt these and then you've got your lumbar support so both on the base of the seat you can pull that make that tighter and wider and here tighter and wider as well really comfy seats and they go down really really low i like to sit nice and low in the car i'm not that tall but i still like to sit really low just it for me it makes you feel more in the car rather than on the car uh, and i do have the power hi-fi unit as well if you're looking for an ff and you've read anything on the forums about how the high the, the stereo is crap it's not that bad everything i'd read i was fully expecting the audio in this to be absolutely garbage and that i'd have to pull it out and it's, it's not that bad at all to be fair we've got uh tweeters tweeters up in the up in the corner there, centre sort of mid-range speaker there. We've got... Ah, oh, goodness, you can't see it, I'm sorry, but there's a speaker there. There's a speaker up the top that you can just see there. Quite a large speaker there. Subwoofer in the boot. It's not too bad. If you're used to anything from Bose or systems that you get in, in Audis and things like that, it, it, it's definitely not as good. It doesn't have the depth. That's not to say it doesn't have bass. It's got plenty of bass and it's got plenty of treble and mid-range, but it just doesn't have the depth. I'm not an audiophile and I can't put my finger on it, but it, it's just not as polished. Um, but it's it's not that bad. It's got navigation, the navigation's not exactly great. Uh, it's got two really clear TFT screens, or LCD screens, either side of the central taco, which are super clear. But the resolution on that is terrible, and you can't get the nav from that screen onto this screen. It doesn't have full postcode search, so uh, get yourself a phone holder and stick your phone in there. Stick Waze on, and you're good to go. The other option that I've got is 
Alicentimenti Speciali, so special arrangements. I've got no idea what that is. I had a bit of a think about it. I googled it and couldn't find anything, but I had a think about it and special arrangements might be that the original owner of this maybe arranged to pick it up from the factory, which would have been a really cool thing to do. Maybe someone knows what that is and can fill me in. I wouldn't mind knowing what that was. So the specification on this car is, I'd say my perfect spec. I, for me, when I was looking, there were plenty of other cars about in black, gray, silver, white. You'd see the odd red one, um, but other than that, you just don't get colors. And for me, I had to have a color. It, it could have been maybe green. I, I like uh, British Verde, but British green is nice. It's a bit unusual and might be a bit difficult to sell, but either that or a blue. So for this to finally get one in Tour de France blue, to get it with the silver wheels and not have to have bought them separately and paint them, to get it with the yellow calipers that match the yellow Scuderia shields, um, to also have it with clear rear windows. Most of these have got the privacy rear, uh, rear quarters and rear glass, which in my mind makes it look a bit unbalanced and also hides the beautiful interior. So to have all that, it really is my perfect spec car. Do I wish it had some other options? Maybe. You can get a panoramic roof, which this obviously doesn't have, but what I would say about that and what you will read, and this is absolutely true, when you are a driver, there is your view. And even if you sit right back, right, 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 right back, that's your view. That panoramic roof means absolutely nothing to the driver or the passenger. If you are a rear seat passenger though, Perfect. So really it's an option for a rear seat passenger. If I'd had the glass on it, I wouldn't be complaining. So that's one thing. The other one is the passenger display. So there, on this model, there was a really basic black and white TFT screen that sits there. I did test drive one that had it. Again, it's just a passenger toy. The passenger can call up the current speed, all the trip information, um, you know, the highest speed and it, uh, the passenger can see what mode you've got the Manatino in. It's just a bit of a toy. Uh, you can get these with cold seats. So this has got heated seats. You can also get them cooled. I live in England, so there's not really much of a call for that. Uh, and cameras, I've got to admit, cameras is one thing that I would have liked. Um, so the camera information pops up in that right Ferrari LCD screen, which is a perfect place to put it. And you would have had a uh, rear camera, front camera, which would have been just above there. And I believe I might have this wrong, but I'm fairly sure it also would have had cameras on the side as well. Because like I said, that's a lot of bonnet. And when you come up to a junction, there's a lot of it sticking out when you're trying to pull out. So that is one thing I would have liked, um, but you know, I'm not missing. Oh, one extra option, Scuderia shields. They aren't standard. Some people prefer it without it. I think, uh, yeah, it's a must for me. It's a big car and it needs, it needs these sorts of details to break it up. And I just think that yellow shield on that beautiful blue paint matching with the calipers is uh, is spot on for me. So in terms of overall condition, uh, the car's got 22,000 miles on it. Looking at the previous MOTs, it looks like it's been driven about a couple of thousand miles a year. Uh, it's only had uh, two previous owners. I'd say for me, Everything looks like it's in almost as new condition. We've got a tiny bit of wear on the bolster, but this semi-aniline leather wears like a good piece of Italian furniture. So 
it actually looks quite nice that way I will keep an eye on it and certainly when I get in and out of the car I actually prop myself up I use my my arm and I lift myself over I'm sure we all do don't we over that just to try and save it a little bit so yeah inside is in impeccable condition outside Again, it's uh, the paint's been looked after really, really well. There's no swell marks on it at all. There's nothing. It's got almost a mirror finish to it. I keep up quite a good cleaning regime myself. I use uh, G Technic spray on waxes. Something I'll detail in another video. But yeah, it's in in very, very good condition. Uh, one dent, one really small dent which I'm sure will be easy enough to pop out and I did see this when I went to go look at the car initially but it didn't bother me. Uh, you can just see that on the door sort of moving up and down. It's tiny. And a small blemish on the front bumper but not that much in the way of stone chips. It doesn't look like the front's been resprayed, although I guess it probably has. Everyone drives these things, don't they? And then the other small thing is we're at the boot now. Just under the middle brake light, you can see a little bit of sagging. And that's just the trim. And the thing is, is that the, the boot, if you have a look at that, that's the... Uh, parcel shelf it's made of leather it's it, everything's everything's made of leather in here so the natural products things are things like that are going to happen so yeah it, it's that section there i guess without that privacy glass it's been sat in the sun and and maybe deformed a little bit it's not causing a problem but it's just something i'll have to be mindful of in the future and i i suppose just being mindful of how much time it spends in the sun. You can sort of see there, the leather is shrinking around those vents on the back as well. So, you know, one day things like that will have to be retrimmed. But yeah, this is the sort of stuff that you take on when you have a car like this. You know, we are only the caretakers of these cars and and we have to keep them for the future generations and just keep on top of little maintenance, things like that. So I fully expect stuff like that to come up occasionally and I'll jump straight on it and get, get things like that sorted out. That's the Ferrari key. You get two with the car and they will record uh, memory options for the, the mirrors and the seats. Key goes in all the way round, but you can't start from there. Starting is from the from the button. When I shut the door, the steering wheel moves to its position. Again, sorry that that's from memory as well. And the seat belt is handed to you. And apologies, I forgot another option. The uh, central tachometer is in yellow. So that's what you're presented with when you climb into the car. The screen on the right, you can customize to either be what you're seeing now, or that can be a, uh, a digital version, or a digitized version of an analog clock. I might be able to quickly change that for you now. I think if I go to set up, and it might be might be car set up uh, do you know what maybe not that will be something for another day take my word for it that that changes I just prefer that large digital readout unfortunately not much else happens on that screen um, for me anyway because I don't have the cameras but you get that basic readout of the track information if the track actually has a name 
like it does there that won't appear over there you just get track and likewise if you put the radio on it won't tell you what radio station it is it will just tell you what uh, preset you saved it as it's a bit basic which is a bit of a waste this screen's incredible this one you've got basically everything that you could want on it um, so for me I tend to have it on this screen most of the time so water pressure uh, water temperature and oil temperature and the reason I have it on this screen is because I've read the book back to front front to back and it says in there that you really shouldn't drive it in any of the higher RPMs and I take that to be anything over 3000 RPM until the oil temperature has reached uh, I think it was 75 degrees and I've done quite a few miles in this already and I can tell you that irrespective of the driving that you're doing or the ambient temperature that oil temperature goes up it takes about 10 minutes of driving for it to get to about 75 to 80 degrees and it stays there it just always stays there so it's nice to have that so you know how you should be treating the engine or if you should still be warming it up or not that's what I tend to look at most of the time uh, occasionally you can flick over to this you've got oil pressure and uh, battery monitor tire pressures and temperatures which is cool and then it just it cycles through those same things you've also got a VDA which is vehicle dynamics don't know what the A stands for but it's vehicle dynamics and then you've got your uh, it's telling you how how ferocious or uh, relaxed I suppose the F1 is traction control, the E diff, the four wheel drive system, um, the DCT, electronic stability control, etc. You can't change them individually, but they change when you change the Manatino. So we're in comfort now. If I drop that down to wet, you can see how that changes. That's snow. I'm going to jump up. To sport so sports quite fun uh, sport you get a very I've, I've noticed it already I mean I need to do more driving in it but even in the small amount of driving I've done the way that the transmission behaves in sport uh, very ferocious really throws you back in your seat um, it's quite a clunky gear change but it's excellent if I'm honest, most of the time I do actually just have it in comfort. Uh, it's only when I get onto a good B road or something that I will chuck it into sport. When you put it into sport, the suspension will firm up and I suppose most of you already know the, the bumpy road button. So that just allows you to untie the firm suspension away from sport and essentially put it back into comfort. You press that and you get bumpy road. If you're in comfort, you don't have to press bumpy road because that is the comfort setting that you're already on. Steering wheel controls. I thought it would take me forever to get used to this, but it's amazing how quickly you get used to things. Um, a quick press turns it on. Another quick press turns it off. A press for, and I'm not kidding, it says this in the manual, 0.3 seconds will give you three flashes. So that's sort of like that okay um, they do auto cancel as well when you when you turn the wheel very easy to get used to the only time it's caught me out is when I've been on a roundabout and the wheel has been turned half lock and I've wanted to indicate left to get out to exit the roundabout and of course the indicator isn't where I expect it to be it's it's kind of up over <laughs> over here that's the only time it doesn't work, but the rest of the time it works fine. You've got your lights there, so if you need to uh, flash someone to get out of my way, you press it. So you just press it, and it, it's not a button, it just it releases when you, when you let go of it. If you want to turn it on, it pulls back towards you and stays on. They're really intuitive, to be fair. That's your windscreen uh, uh, wipers. So if you pull it, it will give you one wipe. If you pull it and hold it, it will wash. If you've got the headlights on at the same time, it will wash the headlights as well. If you press it once, 
it will set the wipers to auto. Uh, we've got a um, sensor up in there and if you keep pressing it, it will simply cycle through uh, on fast, super fast and back to auto. And it's always updated with you so you know what's going on in this screen. It's always telling you what you've got it set to um, so you're not in the dark about it. So that's the steering wheel. Um, no horn there. It's here, obviously. That's a really obvious place to have it. There we go. And there's one on the other side as well. I'd watched a few reviews on on people driving these cars with this steering wheel, and I thought, gee, I bet you must always press that all the time, but it doesn't. You've got to press it quite hard, really. So you know, there's no way you're going to accidentally press when you need to press it you're going to be going for this and <laughs> nothing's happening. Uh, so yeah, that's that. You've got the paddle shifters. These are wonderful things. They're really, really big and they're very tactile in feel and they make a good noise as well when you click them. I know that probably sounds weird, but coming from an Audi with a paddle shifter in it, which is like two little mouse ears, it's really nice to have something big like that. And they are attached to the steering column, so they do not move with the steering wheel. I personally prefer that because I like to know that they are where I left them as I turn the wheel, basically the opposite to what these do. So for me, that's a personal preference to have them there. Uh, we've got plenty of air conditioning gauges, sorry, not gauges, vents, etc. Um, really, really well made. And get that to focus there's a ferrari cavallino on that and you simply turn it up to stop the flow and right to open the flow you've got three in the center one on each side and there's two in the back all really really lovely um lovely appointed uh, lever and uh, all the sort of switch gear in the handles and, and things like that are a lot better than I thought they'd be. I don't know why, I just I expected them not to be that great, but they are quite nice. Nice sort of squishy uh, handles if you need those. Uh, launch, I haven't used yet. Reverse and auto. So when you get in the car, it's in park and it's already in auto. When you start the engine uh, and you want to, to set off, you either, if, you, if you're going forward, if you want to reverse, obviously you go reverse, but if you just want to go forward, you pull the up lever once and the display in the center will say one auto. If you have the handbrake, the park brake, sorry, which is down here, you can release it manually. But if you have it set to auto, which mine is on at the moment, you never have to press the, the, the park brake. As soon as it's on now, indicated by the P up there, as soon as you pop it into gear and put your foot down to accelerate, it will take the handbrake, the handbrake, the park brake off for you, and off you go. You will always set off in auto, always, no matter what. So if you want it out of auto, you just immediately press the auto button, which is a slightly counterintuitive, and that will take it out of auto. There you go, look. So in auto, out of auto and you can change gear yourself. If you've bought a Ferrari, you should always be changing gear yourself. You should never have it in auto. Never, 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 never. When you stop, um, you simply stop. You don't put it into neutral, which you would do if you wanted to do it by pulling both pedals towards you. You just leave it in gear and you turn the car off. As soon as you do that, you'll hear the, the, hair, the park brake turn on. Um, the park brake light will flash and then go solid once it's on. Don't have to touch that. And that's it, it's left. If you do put it into neutral before turning the car off, it activates something called valet mode. And I've done this a couple of times. Um, you don't want that because it leaves the gears disengaged so that if you put it onto an automatic car wash system, it can be pulled along. Yeah, so just leave that, leave that as it is. Basic stuff here, Chrysler sourced um, touchscreen head unit. I'm not gonna go through this because it's actually not, it's not that great. It does what you expect it to do. It's handily got um, a USB socket on the front. It has a 20 gig hard drive inside, so you can actually load all your music on, which is exactly what I've done. So that's handy. 
um, you can plug a headphone socket into here. You can also plug in another, sorry you can't see it, but there's another USB socket in there, and like maybe an external hard drive that you could have in there. It, it's okay, it does, it does the basic functions, what you expect it to do. And although it doesn't look like it's automatic climate control, that is automatic climate control. It has manual buttons to direct the flow of the air and the speed of the air. However, if you press auto, these then become irrelevant. So if even if you've got that set to speed one or speed four, once you press auto, those buttons aren't used at all. It will just do whatever it needs to do to get the temperature to where you need it. Dual zone as well. Um, that's where the button would be for cameras if I had them. You can call them up, I think, at speeds under 15 mile an hour. Electrically released glove box. Plenty of cubby holes. I've got quite a large one in there. It's quite deep. Fit stuff in it. Uh, you can see a cigarette lighter 12 volt socket there. And it's got quite a cool feature where you can pull it forward. So it's not stopping you from being able to close that. This section's quite cool. You can just lay your phone on that or open it up to reveal cup holders. If you've got one big cup, you can only fit one in, but two sort of uh, small to medium sized cups, you can fit one there and one there. I think that's quite cool, but it's little trick is you can slide that out of the way as well and have a perfectly flat tray and it comes with this little rubber thing here so things don't slide around. I just think that's quite cool. I, I didn't realise it did that for about two weeks. I thought I thought I only had this or this and I thought, oh, where am I going to put my cup? In fact, when I first bought the car, I stopped for a coffee and I was putting my coffee in the rear things. And yeah, when I got home, I realised that actually it come out it does that so that's cool it's a nice little bonus it was like getting a free cup holder uh, buttons along the top uh, when you first get into the car it will activate the parking sensors so if you get in and it's beeping non-stop you can turn that off if you're planning on towing the car you need to press that um, you can force the doors to lock or unlock uh, and map lights and centre light Although what you can also do in here is you can set how most of those things work when you get in the car. So you, if you don't want the parking sensors to turn on when you first turn the car on, that's in there. If you want the passenger door to stay locked when you first unlock the car, that's also in there as well. So it's quite customizable. Quick view of the back. So you've got, like I said, those cup holders in there. Pretty much a carbon copy of what's in the front, again with a 12 volt power socket. Lovely seats, a pull up ski chute, and both the rear seats fold down as well. And I've mine's got a leather roof, and the grab handles, these are quite cool. They're magnetic, so if you let go of them, they just, they're not dangling around all the time, they stick back up to the roof. Anyway, I've wafted on far too much. I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching. Next video, I think we'll be tackling, replacing those orange indicators for some clear ones. So stay tuned for that one. Thanks for watching.